What if you knew you were going to die? The only certain future was another day of torture. Spirit broken, body mutilated. Locked behind bars, discarded as filthy trash. Zero hope remained. Nothing short of an act of God could free you from your hell. Live, how's everybody? Good to see you and welcome our downtown campus, Amarillo campus, Church Online, West Texas Network Church is glad you're joining us today as well. Hey, before we get into prison break, two really exciting announcements. First announcement, I've been wanting to make this announcement for about six years, okay, just so you know, and it has to do with our new Southwest campus. How many of you guys knew we were building a new Southwest campus? Anybody know that? You're like, you don't know whether to raise your hand or clap because you're so excited about this. I get that. Me too. Okay. Now, we're excited. Uh, maybe you've driven past it, 103rd and Upland, and we've been building it over the last year or so, and I know you guys have been waiting for the move-in date, right? Like, you're like, when, come on. When are we moving into this thing? I'm excited. We've got a move-in date today. Okay. Here. You can go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Clap. They're clapping here. <laughs> I haven't told you what it is yet, but you're still clapping. That's good. Okay. Here. Move-in date. We've got a move-in date. So we're not going to meet there next weekend, but our first weekend there will be the following weekend, May 4th and 5th. Isn't that exciting? Two weekends from now. <laughs> we will meet in that new campus, and I'm telling you, it is awesome. Okay, you need to drive down 103rd and Upland. Hopefully at all of our other campuses, you'll rejoice with us that we're getting um, a home that we actually officially own, South Upland. Uh, we're really excited about that. Here's something else kind of cool I you guys know about. So... You'd think, okay, for those of you who don't know that are watching via video, our Southwest campus meets in a skating rink. So you'd think, okay, we move out, they're going to have people skating, roller skating, holding hands, singing, you know, all that skating stuff, and parties and all that. Well, have some other good news. A church in town, a friend of mine's the pastor, has purchased this facility, and they're going to turn it into their church. So the Bible's going to continue to be preached up here in what was formerly a skating rink. Isn't that pretty exciting? Another church is going to be meeting here. That's the first announcement. Two weeks from this weekend, let your friends know. We're going to be in a new place. It's going to be awesome. But for those of you that forget, we'll still have some people in the parking lot here being like, why are you coming here? We got a new building. Come on. We're in a new building, so we'll direct you there. Okay. <clears throat> Second announcement. This is pretty exciting, too. Same weekend, May 4th and 5th, we are officially launching eLife on TV in Lubbock. <laughs> Ten o'clock a.m. Sunday mornings on the CBS affiliate KLBK Channel 13 in Lubbock, and here's what's cool: it's in surrounding communities as well. You don't have to have cable, okay, to get this one. And it's not just in Lubbock, but communities around us, some of which have a network church of Experience Life watching our messages already meeting. They're gonna be able to watch it on TV. Now, let me tell you why I'm excited about this, because. We're going to start off doing some series you've already heard, like the first series that's going to be on May 5th will be business time. It'll start with business time. And here's what's cool. You and I, if we got friends, many of us have friends we've tried to invite to this church, and they've been like, oh, I'm not sure. I don't know about that church. I've heard about that church. I'm not sure I'm going to go to that church. Here's what we can say. Here's what we can say. Hey, well, here, here's what I might have you do. Just DVR it, because I know you don't wake up by 10. You can tell your friend that. Okay, just DVR it. That's why I don't go to church. Okay, I get that. DVR it. We got Saturday night services too. DVR it. 10 o'clock, Sunday morning, watch it. You can watch the whole service. You can see it's normal. We don't have people do weird stuff. It's kind of funny, okay, applicable. You'll enjoy it. You can watch some of these past series. And then after you kind of get comfortable with it, you can start coming with me, okay? So you can tell your friend, just DVR, it said DVR. And it was so great. Hundreds of thousands of people all across this region will have access to it. And I'm sure maybe Sunday morning, some of them won't know about it. They'll be scrolling down. They'll be like, Experience Life Church. I've heard of that. And they click and they're going to be like, oh my dang, that is different. 
That is, they told me that was crazy and different. It is, I guarantee you it is. So it's gonna be great, it's gonna be great. Cause you got other paid programming, P90X going on Sunday morning, all these different paid programming. Then you can have eLife be like, oh yeah. I mean, it's gonna look cool, okay? Isn't it that exciting? We're gonna be on TV, that's exciting. So tell your friends about it, have them DVR it. If they won't come with you, say watch it on TV first and then you can come with me the next time. So two announcements, we're excited about what's happening in the next couple of weekends. So be back, you won't wanna miss it. <clears throat> Prison Break, been a fun series so far. I've been telling you a story about, uh, out of this book called Heavenly Man. It's really made an impact on my life. It's about this guy named Brother Yun. He's a Chinese Christian. Told you last couple weekends, he was born in China in a time where they were trying to eradicate Christianity. They were shutting down churches, kicking missionaries out of the country, imprisoning, torturing, executing many Christian pastors. So he's born into this climate becomes a follower of Jesus as a teenager, <clears throat> gets his hands on a Bible. Most people didn't have a Bible. They never heard of this stuff before. He fires them up. He starts memorizing a lot of it. Goes around these different communities telling people about Jesus. Well, the authorities don't like it. They arrest him, put him in jail. He escapes. So if you've missed some of this, some of this was cool. You can watch online. You get previous messages. He escapes. They arrest him again because he keeps doing it. He ends up in this prison. And we learned last weekend he fasts for a period of time, blows everybody away because it was medically impossible for this, extent, this extended period of time that he didn't eat or drink. People are like, who is this guy's God that he could go this time without eating or drinking? And as a result, his cellmates, remember his cellmates that were like urinating all over his face, treating him horribly, they all get saved. Remember last week and they got baptized, he poured water on their heads. I mean, it's just incredible. You got to catch the other talks. If you missed it, you got to watch them. We got them on YouTube. Easy to share with your friends. I said, but the next, next thing you got to know, I said, you got to come back for this weekend. And that is that the director of the prison asked Yun basically if he would do something probably told him rather than asked him, but at least initially asked and just said, hey, we've got this psychotic murderer in this prison. He's on death row. We're going to execute him soon. But we can't keep him from like trying to kill himself. He's trying to kill himself. He's trying to kill other people in his cell. We've heard, Yun, we've heard about what happened in your cell with all these criminals and they all get saved and fired up and their lives are totally changed. So here's what we're going to do, Yun. Here's what we're going to do. We want to put him in your cell and see what happens to him. So Yun's like, I'm down, I'm down. I mean, because he knew, hey, Jesus changed this guy's life. So he goes back and they tell him, they tell Yun too. They tell him, hey, by the way, if he kills himself, we're gonna hold you responsible. If he kills somebody else in that cell, we're gonna hold you responsible. Yun's like, hey, we're gonna do this. So he goes back, he tells his cellmates, new converts, just converted to Christianity, following Jesus. And they're like freaking out. Like, oh no, nah, we heard about that guy. We heard about that guy, that murder, that psycho dude. We've heard about him. He cannot come in here. He'll kill us. He, he will, you know, I mean, he was known to bite people. He's going to bite our noses off, our ears off. Like this guy's crazy. Okay. He can't come in here and either. They're all scared to death, but Yun assures him, Hey, I think Jesus wants to do something awesome in his life. First takeaway, if you're taking notes, is this from the story before we keep going. You got to know this. His cellmates were afraid of this guy, but Takeaway number one, there's never <clears throat> anything to be afraid of. In your life and mine, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's never anything to be afraid of. And even if that's true, you realize we come up with all kinds of good reasons to get afraid, don't we? Stuff we go through, we're scared. So something happens in our life, we're not expecting it. We panic, don't we? Come up with all kinds of good reasons to be afraid. But do you know what the most frequently repeated command in the Bible is? I told you about this in the When Life Falls Apart series. Look, this command appears over and over and over again. Isaiah 41.10. God says this. Don't be what? Don't be afraid. Like you're afraid. Why are you afraid? Don't be afraid. Hey, you're not supposed to be afraid. Never a reason to be afraid. Hey, why, why are you scared? Hey, why are you panicking? There's no reason to be afraid. Why? Here, here. Because this is what he says. I'm, I'm with you. Like he's trying to argue with us throughout scripture that, hey, I'm not just saying don't be afraid and, and have fun trying to not be afraid. He's saying... Don't be afraid. Here's why. I'm God. I can do anything. I'm with you. So there's never a good reason for you or for me to be afraid for followers of Jesus because God is with us. This is what Yun says, one of my favorite quotes in the book. <clears throat> he, says, he says, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, don't be afraid. The Prince of Peace lives in your heart. You should not be scared of anything. If God is for you, no one and nothing can be against you. Isn't that good? Hey, there's no reason to be afraid. Prince of peace, the God who brings peace, resides in us. And if he's for us, who can ever 
be against us. Remember the verse I had you memorized from last weekend? Remember it? We're not going to say it all together this weekend because that sounds like different languages, okay? Because you got different translations and everybody's confused. And by the time everybody's done with it, it's like faded off and people got different words and, and some got crazy words, okay? So I'm just going to say it, but hopefully you memorized it. But it goes along with this. Remember Philippians 4, 6, and 7? And I've memorized it years ago. Different translation. It's not this one. It's NIV. But it just says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind, Christ Jesus. Here's something similar. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. You, saying same, same thing. Hey, there's nothing to be anxious about. You're Christian? There's nothing to worry about. Hey, just pray, and God promises, I'll fill you with peace. A peace that surpasses what you can understand. I'll fill you with that. You just pray. There's no reason to be afraid. Question for you at all of our campuses. Question for you all of our campuses. Right now, what are you afraid of? Just think about it. If we could pass this mic around, I guarantee everybody have something to say. What are you afraid of right now? Finances? Hey, I'm scared. I just don't have trouble making ends meet. Or hey, I'm having trouble finding a job. Or hey, I feel like I'm fixing to lose my job. Health? Hey, I'm real sick. Spouse is sick. Kids are sick. Family members sick. Friends sick. And it's just, you're afraid. You're kind of scared. Your kids, maybe you got older kids and they're just not following Jesus and so it just scares you. They're living in a way that's you just know they're going to get hurt. You're scared. What are you afraid of? As you got that in your mind, let God argue with your fear. He's saying, hey, whatever that is, there's not a good reason to be afraid of that. You know why? He promises us something. I'm with you. I'm God. I can do anything. And I'm with you. So challenge then for this week is as often as you panic for a second get afraid or something comes your way unexpected and you just start to freak out, you got to tell yourself, hey, self, hey, li hey, listen, there's no reason to be afraid. I shouldn't be afraid of this. There's no point in being afraid. What's that going to accomplish? God said he'd be with me. So as often as you and I get afraid, what we're essentially saying is we don't believe that because you know you wouldn't be afraid if you really believed that. The God of the universe is with you. He's with you and he can do anything. If that's true and you believe that, you wouldn't be afraid again. But if you're like me, we struggle with it. So we have to remind ourselves regularly, he's with me. I'm not going to be afraid. He's with me. Takeaway number one, there's never anything to be afraid of. Story goes on. So Wang is the name of the murderer. They stick him in, in the cell. The cellmates are freaked out, okay? He comes in. Yun said he's full of hate, cussing up a storm, saying horrible things to him, trying to cut himself with his handcuffs, and he's got chains around his ankles, just trying to hurt himself. He's bleeding all over the place. <clears throat> Here's what Yun and the cellmates did. They got around him that first day he came into their cell, and they told him, hey, Wang, we're going to take care of you. We're going to take care of you. And they took some of their drinking water from that day, put it on a cloth, they start to clean up his face. He had dry blood on his face, dirt on his face. They start cleaning up his face. They start giving him food, helping him eat because he was having trouble with his hands. They start feeding him. They start bandaging up his wounds from where the handcuffs and the chains had cut him. They were kind of bandaging his wounds. This goes on for a time, this whole giving him food and helping him to drink, and he just can't take it anymore. So Wang, the murderer, psychotic murderer, breaks down. And this is what he says. <clears throat> he says to Yun, older brother, why do you love me like this? Why didn't you eat your bread last night? I'm a murderer hated by all men. Even my own parents, my brother and sister and my fiance have disowned me. Why do you love me so much? I cannot repay you your kindness now, but after I die and become a ghost, I'll come back to your cell and serve you for the good deeds that you've done. Yun said, I knew this was the time. The Lord wanted me to share the gospel with him. I told Wang, it's because Jesus loves you that we're treating you so nicely. If we didn't believe in him, we would have treated you the same way as the men in cell nine. You should thank God for his son, Jesus Christ. Immediately, Wang said, Lord, I thank you for loving a sinner like me, this hardened criminal 
tearfully accepted the love of Jesus into his heart. He was released from his burden of sin. All the other prisoners were so happy. They realized that only the love of God can give true hope to those bound by sin. After Wang received God's salvation, the atmosphere in the cell greatly improved. Everyone began to sing together, and Wang was so eager to learn all he could, and his life was totally changed. Takeaway number two. Christians should be the most loving people in the whole world. If you take a note, Christians, it's you and me, those of us that have committed our lives to Jesus, should be the most loving people in the world. That should be our reputation, kind of like what you see in this story. But too often, I'm sure you agree with me, that's not the reputation of Christians. But it should be, because think about it. <clears throat> you commit your life to Christ. The Bible says our God is love. He comes to dwell within us. By the Holy Spirit, it's what the Bible teaches. God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us. And then he loves through us. So there should be a distinction, a huge difference between the love of a Christian and the love of somebody who's not a Christian. I'm not saying somebody who's not a Christian can't be loving. They can. But the person that is a Christian should be so much more loving because their God is loving through them and loving in a way they couldn't love on their own that it's noticeable, that there's a distinction. People say, whoa, whoa. Whoa. Yeah, that person's loving, but you, that's, I don't know, man. I don't think you can be that loving on your own. I think God would have to help you be that loving. This is what Jesus says about this, Jesus. John 13, 35, he said, your love, he's talking to his disciples, your love for one another will prove, watch this, it's gonna prove to the world that you're my disciples. What's gonna prove to the world that they follow Jesus? What they say? They're going to say a lot, and it's good to talk about Jesus. What's going to prove to the world, the followers of Jesus, is their love for one another. Like he's saying, <clears throat> here's how the world's going to know. You guys, disciples, here's how the world's going to know you follow me. You're going to love each other and love others so much, they're going to be like, whoa, hold on. That's a lot like Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Do you follow Jesus? Like, the world's going to know you love me and you follow me because of your love for each other. It's going to prove to everybody you're my follower, regardless of what you say. And we should be saying things for sure, but our love should be evidence in and of itself. They must follow Jesus because Jesus, the Holy Spirit, must be loving through them. I've got kind of a convicting question for you. <clears throat> I asked myself this too this week. Do people often comment on what a loving person you are and how they can tell a difference kind of between you and everybody else? Because they should, right? They should for me. That if somebody, a friend of ours that's not a believer, has you as a believing friend and then a bunch of non-believing friends, they should see a difference and probably the difference should be so dramatic that they comment on it. Hey, <clears throat> what's so different about you? Like the love that you have for me and for others is just outstanding. Where did that come from? People ask you that very much? People don't always ask me that very much, and that's convicting to me because it's my love for other people that proves to you and to the world that I'm a disciple of Jesus. You too. It's the same for you too. Here's kind of a crazy challenge this week. Some of you are going to take me up on it. You can have some crazy stories as a result. Why don't this week <clears throat> you find the most hateful person you know the most angry person you know, and go out of your way to serve them in some way? Why don't you just blow their minds by desiring to love and serve them even though they've been hateful to you and hateful to others? Why not? Because here's what we know from the story and in life. Love can melt a hateful, angry heart. It's hard to hate a loving person. And like Wang was shocked by their love. And they admitted, hey, it's only because of Jesus. People should be shocked by our love too. And we shouldn't just love those that are lovable. We should love those that are hateful. We should love those that are angry. Why not this week? Try it. <laughs> Try it. See what happens. All right. Keep going. So, Christians should be the most loving people in the world. Not always we should be. So, Wang starts telling him his story. He's saved on fire for Jesus. He tells him his background, Yun and the cellmates. He says, here's, here's how I was. <clears throat> Born at home, dad was wealthy. 
member of the Communist Party and got involved with gangs, he said as a teenager. Got on the wrong path. Said he started drinking heavily. Said he started robbing stores. Said he murdered some innocent people. Said he raped some people as well. He said, I was such a bad person. He said, they arrested me. They put me in jail. He said, because my dad was wealthy, he was able to bribe the director of the jail and he let me go. He said, but I was so depressed because of what I had done that I went out and I did it again. And he went out and he actually killed one of his friends. They arrest him again. This time, doesn't matter how much money dad has, they're not going to let him out. So this is the state that he's in on death row in this prison when he encounters Yun and these other believers. And look at what happened to him. This is what I think it proves. Look at this. Takeaway three. God doesn't give up on people. <laughs> Do you know that? <clears throat> God doesn't give up on people. I mean, you think if God was going to give up on somebody, he'd give up on Wayne, right? I mean, killing people, raping people, robbing stores, angry, hateful. He, would he give up on Wayne? He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. And he put him in the cell with this guy, Brother Yun. He comes to know the Lord. His heart's set on fire. He didn't give up on him. There's another guy in the Bible. Had a rough past. You'd think if God was going to give up on somebody, he'd give up on this guy. But he didn't. This is Paul. You remember Paul? He used to be called Saul. Name was changed to Paul. He used to persecute Christians. He, he was attacking God's people. And like these guys that were stoning Christians, they take off their robes so they, you know, stone these people. And he'd hold their robes, kind of in approval of what they were doing. Look, look at this. Look what he said. When we talk about giving up on people, you think, oh, God's probably giving up on me. You think so? Well, look at this. 1 Timothy 1, 15, 16, Paul said, this is a trustworthy saying. <clears throat> Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me, Paul said, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a, well, I love this, a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. He's saying, I'm, I got you beat. Hey, you think you're bad? I got you beat. God's using me, though, as an example that he's patient even with people that are horribly sinful. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Here's what you got to know. God didn't give up on Wang. He didn't give up on Paul. He hadn't given up on you either. Some of you here today, you're like, God's given up on me. I know he has. Look at what I've done. No, I guarantee you your past is not as bad as these guys because if it was, you wouldn't be here. You'd be in jail, okay? He ain't given up on you. Doesn't matter what you've done where you've been, what names you've called him. He loves you. He gave his son for you. He died on a cross for you just to demonstrate for you how much he loves you. And in case you think he's given up on you, I want you to know today, I got good news. You're wrong. You're wrong. And the Bible makes it clear that regardless of what you've done, if you'll admit that you're a sinner, repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and ask Jesus to save you rescue you, help you get to heaven because you recognize you'll never be good enough. The standard's perfection. You got no chance on your own. He will save you. He will rescue you. He will help you get to heaven as you make that decision to commit your life to Christ. It's not something you do for him. It's something he's done for you that you receive by faith, by saying, Jesus, I believe it. And so as a result, I'm asking for it. Forgive me, save me, rescue me. And he will regardless of what you've done. You know why? Because he hasn't given up on you. If you're here today, you believe that, you're ready to commit your life to Christ, just, just simple prayer saying, Jesus, best I know how, my life is yours. I need you. Save me. Rescue me. And he will. And we always ask you to let us know. <clears throat> By checking on this connection card, I'm committing my life to Christ, taking it to a Next Step Center at the back at all of our campuses. And we'll give you a nice Bible that'll help you as you begin to follow Jesus. Leather Bible that you can go to one of the bookstores and get your name engraved on it. Nothing more important, though, than that. And here's what you got to know. If you're already a Christian, already a follower of Jesus, God hadn't given up on your friends either. He hadn't given up on your family members either. Some of you have been praying for some people for a long time. You're like, I'm fixing to give up on them. I guarantee you. I've been praying for years. God hadn't given up on them. Why would you? There's some people in my life I've been praying for 10, 15 years they'd follow Jesus. They still haven't. I'm not giving up on them, though. You know why? Because God ain't given up on them. 
He ain't giving up on him. And I've seen some people that I prayed for for over 10 years come to know Christ. It's amazing. Don't give up on people. Some of you got some people close to you. You're dying for them to know Jesus. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. You keep praying. Prayer changes things. If you hadn't figured that out, you just keep praying. Last part of the story. One more takeaway and we'll be done. So Wang is fired up. He wants to live the remainder of his days for Jesus because he's going to be executed soon. So here's what he starts doing. <laughs> he's so excited about what Jesus has done for him. He starts singing a lot. I don't know how it sounded. I don't know what song he sang, okay? But it was so loud that it annoyed the guards. And so supposedly, according to Yun, <clears throat> on a regular basis, people come down to the cell to calm him down like, stop singing so loud. What are you singing about? He's just, I have, yeah. he's just singing. He's just singing. Because he's excited. I guess that's what you do when you're excited. You sing, God, thanks for saving me. Jesus, thanks for what you did for me. They couldn't calm him down. Anyways, he wants his family to know about what Jesus has done for him. They'd never heard of Jesus. So he writes him a letter. And he asks Yun if he'll deliver it to him when he gets out of prison. He says, sure. So this is what he writes to his family. <clears throat> this murderer, former murderer, says this. Dear Papa and Mama, I cannot see you anymore. But I know you love me. Your son has dishonored you. Please don't feel sad after I die. I want to tell you some tremendous news. I will not die, for I've received eternal life. I met a merciful man in the prison, the respected brother Yun. He rescued my life and helped me believe in Jesus. He loved me and cared for me and fed me every day. Papa and Mama, I'm on my way to the kingdom of God. I'll pray for you all. You must believe in Jesus too. Please allow my brother, Yun, share the gospel with you. When he visits you, he will tell you the rest of my story. May you receive eternal life. Then he said, see in the kingdom of God, your son, Wayne. Gave that to Brother Yun. Brother Yun said, hey, I got it, man. I'll take it to him when I get out of prison. And he wrote that letter one day. He was executed the next day. And here's what it says in the book. As he was taken out of his cell to be executed for his crimes. He looked back to his cellmates, to Yun and the others. He smiled at them and he said, hey, you guys, don't worry about me. I'll see you in heaven. I'll see you in heaven. Three and a half years later, Yun gets out of prison and he goes to visit his parents. He tells them, hey, you've probably heard your son is dead. Well, his body is, but his spirit is alive with Jesus. He said, and his last request is that you would believe in Jesus too, so you could have eternal life. So he reads him the letter, gives him the letter, shares the gospel with him, and the whole family commits their life, their lives to Jesus. The whole family is changed because of the testimony of their son. Takeaway number four. Once Jesus saves you, you'll want everyone to know. Right? That just makes sense. Like Wayne, he wanted everybody to know. If Jesus had saved him and he could save them too. Once he saves you, you want everyone to know. This is how it was in the Bible too. Look at this. When they met Jesus, John 1, 41 and following, Andrew went to find his brother, Simon, who's later Peter, told him, we found the Messiah. Hey, brother, hey, we found the Savior, the one who came to help us, rescue us. We found him. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Hey, you gotta come meet him. His name's Jesus. You gotta come meet him, Simon. He told his brother, of course he would, because Jesus was so great. Later on, it says, Philip, he went and told his friend Nathaniel, said, hey, 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 friend, 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 hey, the Savior's here. The Messiah's come. you got to come meet him. He brings him to meet Jesus. Why? Because that's what you do, right? When Jesus saves you, you're so thrilled. You were headed to hell. Now you're headed to heaven. <clears throat> you want everybody to know. So you go and tell people. It's a question for you. Those of you that Jesus is saved. Those of you that are committed your life to Jesus, have you told everybody you know? Because I talk to a lot of Christians that would say, no, I haven't. And I'd ask, well, why not? I mean, what? Why? Why wouldn't you? That's just what happens, right? Because it's good news, right? Like, are you, is Jesus not that great? Is that why? Well, no, I think Jesus is great. <clears throat> well, is the good news not good news? Is it bad news or average news? No, it's, it's, it's good news. Then what's the problem? Are you afraid? Yeah, well, maybe I'm afraid. Well, we've already talked about that, right? Never anything to be afraid of. Some people say, no, I'm not afraid. Well, are you ashamed 
You embarrassed? Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> to which I'd be like, why? You think he was ashamed of you when he was being tortured and humiliated before a bunch of people because he loved you so much he wanted to pay the penalty for your sin and he hung up on a cross publicly allowing himself to be humiliated? He could have called angels down. They could have rescued him. He wasn't ashamed of you. He was humiliated for you because he loved you so much. That's how much he loved you. He gave his life, Jesus did on a cross for you. Why would you be embarrassed or ashamed? He wasn't ashamed of you. Well, good question. I don't, I don't know why. Well, then why don't you start making sure everybody that you know knows about what he's done for you? Because did you know, that's one of the reasons we're still here, the Bible says. I want to give you another verse to memorize for next time if you'd like, if you're participating. Hopefully you are. But you got to know this verse because <laughs> when you start asking about God's will for your life and what's the my point, purpose of being here, you got to start here because he tells you. Because think about it. Why didn't God just beam us up to heaven when we got saved? Why do we have to stay here? Well, he tells us. One of the reasons we're still here. You can memorize it. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It's the Great Commission. Hopefully you'll memorize it if you don't know it already. It just says this. Here, here's one of the reasons you're still here. He said, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. You got to know that one because God can bring it to your memory, remind you, hey, this is why you're, one of the reasons you're here is you're making a job choice, decision about this or that. Hey, I'm, I'm supposed to be thinking about making disciples. That's one of the reasons I'm here. You got to know, know that. You got to know that. One of the things we do in our groups each week you need help with this is we keep ourselves accountable in this by what we're trying to do is share with somebody we know that doesn't know Jesus with at least one person a week take a next step with them so this friend you invite them to lunch talk to them about what Jesus has done for you or this friend you give a book to them this friend you invite them to church but each week you're kind of being held accountable in our groups for taking a next step with somebody that doesn't know Jesus because this is something we're supposed to be active in doing this is one of the reasons you and I are still here Go make disciples. Tell people about what Jesus has done for us. Because if you love them and care about them, you'd want to make sure they've asked Jesus to do the same thing for them so that you spend all of eternity with them. This is huge. Once Jesus saves you, you should want everyone to know. That's kind of like an evidence of the fact that you really know him. Because I would just think if somebody didn't want everybody to know, man, they must not know Jesus because he is so and unbelievably great that once you meet him, you can go get your brother. Hey, brother, come here. Hey, Frank, come here. You got to meet him. You got to meet him. He changed my life. He's amazing. He's amazing. Next weekend, we're going to wrap up uh, this story. And, you know, later in this story, some American pastors ask Brother Yun, Hey, why aren't we experiencing in our country the same thing you've seen in yours? Not just the miracles, but like tens of millions of people coming to know Christ. Why haven't we seen that? Uh, why haven't we seen people set so on fire for Jesus? They tell everybody they know and they're willing to be imprisoned even though that wouldn't happen here, but they're willing to give up their lives for Jesus. They're just that on fire. You can tell why. Do we not have a lot of people in our country like that? They ask, Yun, you'll never believe what he told these American pastors. But in order to find out, you're going to have to come back next weekend. We're going to talk about it then. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for how great you are. You are so amazing. Forgive us for not always telling everybody we know about you and what you've done for us. Thank you. We got nothing to be afraid of. God, help us to be the most loving people in the world. Not give up on people that haven't yet committed their lives to Christ because you haven't given up on them. Thanks, God, for this story. It's a powerful story of a modern-day person, a hero. He's still alive. Somebody followed Jesus so closely that we can learn from. God, help us truly to learn from this and to imitate this, to apply this to our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.